So thank you everyone for coming. So I'm going to go straight in now to just share my screen. So please, if at any time you cannot quite hear me because of the connection, let me know I'll stop and double back. And if at any time I get skipped out, Lisa will be holding down the fort um, and I'll try and get back in as quickly as I can. Okay, once again, thank you for joining us um, to Africa, a virtual tour of the African safaris, you know, and must see destinations for anyone who is planning to come either for the first time, or this is not your first, this time. Is not your first time. There are certain um, places that you should um, see. All right. So this is our itinerary. We're going to find the most visit safaris in Africa, the popular ones, the ones who have kept their reputation over time, um, the ones who get constant visits, the ones who are like really have the animals and the ones who also have a protection program going on for the endangered ones and also to stop the other animals from getting on the endangered list. We're going to get acquainted with the big five. Um, every time you're talking about um, animals in Africa, the big five are mentioned. And so today I'm going to share with you which particular animals are the big five and also kind of relate the cultural and traditional view of these animals. This is mostly why they are considered big five anyway. You know, the place they have in the hierarchy of culture and tradition. Then we're going to learn how their prints influence um, fabrics and fashion. Animal prints are all the rage. I don't think there's any fashion, there's no decade, you know, the animal prints don't feature hugely. And most times the, the animal prints that are kind of authentic, you know, they cost so much, especially now with so much restrictions and, and all of that. Of course, now a lot of people are looking for alternatives, you know, being conscious of the earth and all of that. And then we're going to see the other places that you have to see in Africa. You know, the waterfalls, the pyramids, of course, the popular ones, and maybe the not so popular ones that you have heard. All right. So the big five refers to the most dangerous and the most challenging animals um, that are found in the in the wilds of Africa. Now the wilds of the, the you would find animals in the savanna, you would also find them in the forest. So because you know, typically Africa cross, I mean, just like most continents, you would have the desert areas and then you'd have the areas closer to the coast that are thick, you know, with, um, with foliage, with forest, you know, mangrove forests are popular in Africa. That's, the thickest forests that you find. And so some of these animals were found in those places, especially the lion. Um, but most of these are actually in the savanna, in the plains, uh, in the plains of the savanna, which is where you now find the Africa, the safaris, the, the parks, you know, the safari parks that dot Eastern Africa and some parts of Southern Africa. So they are large mammals commonly sought after by tourists on African safaris and by hunters. Traditionally, these are the animals that hunters would go out for, that would put their name on the map, so to speak, that would announce them as hunters of prowess and courage, you know, and boldness. They're, they're, because of their size, because of their strength, and then because they are kind of like of higher intelligence than the regular animals you find, you know, easily. So for this reason, they are termed the best five. I don't know how many you can identify just by looking at the photos, but I'm going to highlight and spotlight each and every one of them in the coming slides. So of course, the first is the majestic lion. You know, um, the lion in African culture represents courage and leadership. Um, you hear about the courage of the heart of a lion. So many chiefs and rulers are referred to as lions. In Hausa language, you say Zaki. Zaki refers to lion. And so that's 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 like um 
one of the praise names of the emir, any ruler. You call him Zaiki. You know, and when 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 well, the praise singing in Africa, when you you hail them and you connect them to animals that have, you know, that are that have high regard, it's like you're pumping them up, you know, and the chances of getting what you want from that ruler becomes really high. So one of the one of the words that are used in northern Nigeria in Hausa speaking communities and kingdoms of the past in the north is Zaiki. When you refer to him as Zaiki, it means that he faces difficult decisions with courage. You know, he faces armies with courage. And then the people are saying, we are also, we have confidence in your leadership abilities. We know that whatever it is, you're facing it off for our sakes. And so animals are social. They're referred to as social cats because they dwell in prides. You know, they dwell in groups, but, but the male is the really dominant um, person there. You know, he's dominant, even though it's the, the, the lioness that takes care of the cubs, you know, and basically keeps the house. The lion maintains his position and he's always ready to fight for it. You know that their groups are called pride. Um, I think the Lion King has done a lot in helping us understand the lifestyle of lions. And so he's the king of the jungle. In any culture, the lion is the king of the jungle. Whether the forest or in the savanna, the lion is known as the king of the jungle. And so they're, they, they're like social. They already have structures. Pride would consist of maybe several nuclear lion families, you know, and they would hunt together. The, the lionesses would go off together to hunt. You know, the lions would fight off threats. So they have cooperative, they, they, there's a synergy among the individual groups within the within the pride. They are also very territorial. You can't just happen on a pride in their territory and expect to get away scot-free. You know, they're really territorial. They take charge of whatever geography, whatever area they're in. You know, they also bond socially. I'm sure if you are a fan of watching some of these um, National Geographic, you see how they play, how the cubs play, how the cubs and the lionesses, you know, and even the lion and the lionesses, some of the some of the social interactions that they have, they can also form coalitions. Lions from different um, groups can come together. Lionesses from different groups come together for hunting, for protection, you know, and all of that. There's also the social hierarchy that I mentioned. The lion is at the top. Even though uh, you could argue that he doesn't do much, He's still at the top. And then they have give and take behaviors within their pride. And honestly, I think some of the fashion things were borrowed from traditional uses. Because anytime a, a hunter kills a lion, sometimes he makes a present of it to the ruler. And so in a ruler's hut or his um, palace, you would see these animal skins. You know, they're all over. The person would wear the skin. You see it draped sometimes across um, the chest of the males. Even with the head of the lion, they have a way of skinning the head. And so if you remember coming to America, the king had some skins around him. Lion skin can also be used as floor covering. You know, it can be used as clothing. It can be draped on the chairs. And all of that is just to show um, all the characteristics that we said. He's a ruler, he's dominant, he's, you know, he's the head, he's the leader. So when you see the skins all around in a typical African setting, that is the language, that is the what it's trying to communicate. And so the hunters, typically when hunters go out hunting and they kill any big animal, certain parts belong to them because that is like their trophy much like hunting in any other part of the world. The, the skin, the, the horns, it becomes their trophy. It's luxurious texture. It's, it's limited uh, supply. 
the demand is high, the supply is low. And just because of the effort, I guess, the effort and the, the courage it takes to hunt them down, they become really exclusive. And so that translated into high-end fashion, you know, where they're used for coats, for jackets, for trimmings, you know, and so many fashions you see that mimic the mane of um, some fur coats that would mimic the mane of a lion, you know, and they look very trendy. You know, of course, with the tailoring, they just look so exquisite and you just want to have it. But due to conser conservation concerns and legal um, restrictions, on hunting, like I said earlier, you now have alternatives, al alternatives to the actual lion's mane being used. So today, most lions can be found at the Serengeti National Park, and that's in um, Tanzania. This is one of the more popular um, parks. I don't know, has anyone been to, you can unmute if you've been to Serengeti, and share a little bit of your experience to just um, help others who haven't. Has anyone been to Serengeti National Park on a safari tour? Okay, so the Serengeti is one of the more popular national parks. It's 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 been in existence for a long time. It really has um, a wide array of animals. Like they really doing a good job in making sure that the animals stay in their natural habitats. And so most times visitors would see the, they would see most of the animals, you know, that are, that are living there. So the lions there, they roam freely. And like I mentioned, the Lion King was inspired by the wildlife found in the Serengeti. And so this includes Simba and the pride lions as well. So a lot of, um, a lot of inspiration, a lot of information you know, about their life, the way they live, the way they interact, you know, and all of that. So next we go to the elephant. The elephant happens to be our focus animal in the block of the month this March. And we have talked a, a lot about its cognitive ability, how, how intelligent it is, how intentional they are with speech, you know, how they're very social, you know, and honestly, um, elephants are wise but they are they keep to themselves they mind their business in spite of their size you know and their strength you know um in folk tales the animal the the elephant by virtue of its size it's seen as well it doesn't have the cutthroat characteristics of the lion but in the folk tales i remember you know with the lion uh with the elephants being prominent they are just seen as just being revered because of their size and their wisdom is it's not usually cast into the role of a forceful you know animal or wily cunning crafty no just being respected by virtue of size that's most of the role and it doesn't really feature much because it's really gentle most of the folk tales um have to do with like the fast the cunning you know the strong and all of that. So the lion usually is just plays a small role, if you like. But in, interestingly, in some tribes where they revere the lion, they give um they give attributes of the lion to some of their activities. Like in Cameroon, the lion is placed higher than any other thing. We also, this this month, I think in block of the month, we also talked about the elephants in the room, the obvious problem that everyone wants to ignore, but that needs to be resolved. You know, we also talked about elephant dances um, by certain tribes. We talked about the elephant, um, the elephant groups, the elephant secret societies. And so all of these are attributed to the ele elephant. The elephant is the wise doesn't get into conflict, conducts itself very, very well. So historically, even in Africa, the, ele the ivory from the elephants has always been sought after because of its, its strength, its ability to be shaped into jewelry, into talismans, into 
you know, so many other objects. Animal skin is also used in fashion, shoes, bags, both historically and even now, I think the tusk is what really attracts people. And honestly, seeing images of lions that their tusks are ripped out from them is so heartbreaking because you just people just bring down these big animals and and they use um saws to like cut out the flesh and just to get out that tusk. And so of course the tusk is is now like extremely illegal to be seen with it, you know, um, to travel with it. And I know that the pop elephant population in Nigeria has drastically reduced because of hunters. I don't think we have much of a, we really don't have much legislation when it comes to, oh, well, not enforceable. We do have legislation, but it's not really enforceable. And so this illegal hunting has really depleted the numbers of the elephants that we've had in the savanna. Um, they are definitely endangered. You know, people are working hard to make sure that they reproduce them, protect them, you know, and keep them, um, keep them safe. And so elephants are mostly found in the Chobe National Park in Botswana. Botswana is in the southern part of Africa. Serengeti is in the eastern part of Africa. Just to give you some reference, if you're thinking, oh, where am I going? So chances are if you are traveling to southern to South Africa, Botswana would be the place you would go. The Chobe National Park would be the place to go. If you're going to Kenya, then the Serengeti would be where you would go because Tanzania is like a neighbor to Kenya. So this, this talk is really just to give you like an overview so you can kind of geographically place where these animals are most found and then where some of the parks and some of the other destinations that we feel you should attend um, on the map of Africa where they are. Um, the Chobe National Park is referred to as the elephant capital of Africa because of its large population, around 50,000, which is really high because I think all in all, there are just a few are they up to 100,000, you know, left around Africa? And the park lies within the Savuti Marsh. It floods, it dries, it floods, it dries. And it's been like that, you know, for a long time. So if elephants are your thing, of course, elephants are also found in Asia. But for the African elephant, the best place to go to would be Botswana. Botswana also has some of the beautiful on the um, not so popular parks. In Southern Africa, you have quite a number. And the Chobe National Park is one of them. So now we're going to talk about the buffalo. The buffalo, I think, is mostly found in eastern part of Africa. This is not an animal that you would find in West Africa. You find the lion in West Africa. You find the elephant in West Africa, but not so much the buffalo. So the buffalo is a symbol of resilience and strength and determination just by its sheer size and it's just willful determination. You know, the buffalo is so, it's so thick skinned <laughs> that sometimes it doesn't matter what's coming at it. It just, it just rushes in as well. So it has the ability to also um, withstand harsh conditions and defend itself. It's fast, it has strength. And then of course it has that bold courage. You know, um, the buffalo is thick skinned the African buffalo, just to mention, the African buffalo is different from the Native American buffalo. The same buffalo, but like different species. There's a resemblance in looks, but they don't really so much um, look alike. So this is a third animal in the among the big five. Buffalo skin is also used for fashion items. But I think the peculiar thing about the buffalo is because it's being used for food, buffalo meat, and I think, is it mozzarella cheese? Um, so its skin usually is more available, even though it's not as popular, but it's more available because when they're raised for food, the skin become like um, as a byproduct can be used for other things such as these um these fashion items the african buffaloes are considered stronger and wilder like wild buffaloes 
You know, I don't think you can tame those ones um, and breed them for, for food as easily. Buffaloes are found in Ngorongoro Crater in Tanzania. Um, the crater is where the Maasai people dwell. The Maasai people, you know, are hunters. Um, in all of their traditional dressing, you see them carrying their long spears. And so the buffalo is resides there. And the that area is usually such a flat land with some with some hills, you know, but it's mostly just like flat land where the buffalo grazes and moves according to the seasons to find food. Um, the Ngorongoro crater is also um a UNESCO heritage site. And that's where most of the buffaloes are found. And then you go for the rhinoceros. I think rhinoceros is, is it, I think it's peculiar to Africa. I'm not sure it's found any sort of species is found anywhere else. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's found anywhere else. So the rhino is, He's mean. <laughs> he looks mean. He's so big and aggressive and just ready to go, ready to for a fight. And this one is a, also another thick-skinned animal. Um, and so big game hunters really go for the rhino because of its sheer size and just just force. It is forceful. I think. I, I think I read somewhere that a rhino can stop a moving vehicle. I don't know how true that is, but just a full grown rhino, they grow so big and you know, there's, they, they have such body mass, you know, that I read somewhere, I'm not sure how true it is, but that it can stop a moving vehicle. You know, they are notoriously aggressive. You know, of course they keep to themselves, but when they feel threatened, they just go all out and they're ready to destroy and, and, kill whatever it is that is coming after them. They are seen as a, as a symbol of strength or protection and defense. And the position of their horn, just a single horn in the middle of the head makes it unique because you don't really, I mean, I think it's, well, apart from the unicorn, <laughs> which is a mystical animal, I think the rhino is the only, um, is the only real animal with a horn like right in the middle of its head. So rhino horns are used as traditional medicine. You know, they are used to hold potions. They are used to consult with spirits, you know, and I think that's mostly what they're used for because they are so difficult to pin down, so difficult to kill, so difficult to be used, um, to just be seen and killed. So for anyone to kill a rhino, they would be considered to have like big magic. You know, they would have big magic to be able to bring down an animal of that size. So mostly the skin, um, but like the, like the buffalo, it's not popular. It's not as common. It's not as popular as the lion, you know, and the, the other cats, the other cats, there's, the skins, their skins are the most popular for use, whether in traditional Africa or in the fashion world. And so the rhino, yeah, it's used for bags and belts, but it's not that um, common. And so the rhino, incidentally, is one of the most endangered because, because of its brute force, communities would fear it. So more cons concerted effort would be, would be taken to kill it and make sure that it's... Um, it's brought down. There are only, I mean, about 30,000 rhinos that exist today, you know, so, but interestingly, I don't think their conversation, their, what you call it, their conservation, the conservation efforts to preserve the rhinos, I don't think they are that, it's that, um, it's not that popular, it's not that big, like the other, like the, say the lion, for instance, or the, or the elephant. And so you can find the rhino at the Itosha National Park in Namibia. Namibia is in 
southern part of Africa, neighbor to Botswana and Southern Africa. Um, yeah, so that's where you would find it. In Etosha National Park, the thing to note about it is that they have natural and artificial waterholes that make the survival of the black and the white. Um, and then to mention that the white rhino is is rare, like most white animals, white lions, white rhino, they are rare. And they would be considered as omens of some sort. You know, something would be attached to them, you know. Um, so the watering holes would be where these rhinos would refresh themselves, you know, and cool off. And also, interestingly, the Et Etosha Pan um, is within the Etosha National Park, the largest salt pan in the world, one of the largest um, salt pans in the world. And so we come to the cunning leopard. The leopard, first of all, is an animal that features very well, very common, very popular in African folk tales. If you're thinking of um, African folk tales, you have the leopard, you have the lion, you'd have the hyena. Then you have the smaller animals like the hare, the turtle, we call them tortoise. So I don't know if the turtle and the tortoise are the same. I think the turtle is one that lives 50% in water and the tortoise is a land-based one. So we have the tortoise, um, we have the rabbit as well. Those are the animals that feature mostly in African folk tales. One, because the smaller animals are used to show that you may be small, but if you're smart and quick, you can still uh, you can still do well against the bigger animals. But the leopard is one of the animals that features really, really well in um in African folktale because it is stealthy, it's quiet, it's quick, it's independent. You know, you don't see them in prides or groups like you do the elephant and the lion, you know. It blends in, it hides within the trees, you know, or the tall savanna grasses, you know, and it's resourceful, it's cunning, it's very agile, very quick, very deadly as well. So it's a cunning leopard. The leopard print, I think, is one of the most better known prints in fashion, one of the most sought after, and one of the first that were actually replicated um in synthetic fabrics or reproduced you know for fashion you know it shows ultra sophistication you know and mystery and just being you know um a fashion icon and all of that and i think even today even with the ban you still find some high end designers still featuring the prints i don't think they can ever go out of style you find them in everything now, in stationery, in clothing, shoes, bags, of course, everything you can think of. Even in African fabrics, you have the, you now have the leopard print. It's really one of the most popular, um, most popular prints. That, like I said, I don't ever think it's going to go away now. So the leopards can be found in the Muremi Game Reserve in Botswana. Botswana, like I said, it's in the southern part of Africa. Um, in the savanna would be, you'd see some shrubs, some trees, and then you'd see lots of grassland. You know, apart from the ones in, in Kenya, in Eastern Africa, where you see more of like large areas of grassland without trees. And so this would be exactly what you'll find in Western Africa as well just shrubs, trees, grasses, shrub trees, grasses. And so um, the Moremi Game Reserve is situated in the Okavango Delta, also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the Moremi Game Reserve takes its name from the chief of one of the Botswana, um, Batawana tribe, one of the Bos Botswana um, tribes called the Batawana tribe, you know, um, it was one of the first locally established reserves. The truth is, the truth is that you find most of the reserves, most of the national parks and the reserves in countries where there's a lot of white 
population. You do not typically find reserves in Black, Indigenous African countries, like the countries of West Africa. You do not typically find reserves because, um, okay, so maybe I should round up with that at the end. I'll just go on to the giraffe. The giraffe is not really considered one of the big five, but it's close because of its uniqueness. It's um, it's not so common. You know, you don't really find it across across the board in Africa the way you do the other animals. Um, they're elegant, they're elongated, they're just graceful. And then they have the most amazing eyelashes. I can never get over the eyelashes of a giraffe. So long and so girly and so, you know, just flutter worthy, just so beautiful and so dark. And then it also looks like they line their eyes. I don't know how that happens, but they're just known for their grace, their beauty and their and aspiration because they are high, they are tall. So they seem like, you know, something to aspire to. And then, you know, the, the giraffes are, their unique pattern is actually becoming popular. It originally wasn't as popular as say maybe the leopard or the lion, but these days you find that the giraffe is featuring more in fashion. Their larger pattern, the larger pattern of their of their skin, you know, it's 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 quite large. It's larger than the leopard, um, the patterns. So you find that it is used mostly as decorative accents, you know, um, accessories, also shoes, bags, belts, you know, all of this feature. But I think with the experience the con conservationists have had with the other animals, they are really being very intentional about conserving the giraffe. The giraffe is, the, because of how it is, the giraffe who exists easily is not, is not so much of a threat. So you find it can move across um, different animals and it thrives in suburban communities. It's not threatening. It's gentle. It may be big, but it's really gentle. And so one of the very interesting places that you can find giraffe is a giraffe manor in Kenya. It is this couple that took this old colonial manor and they, they are collaborating with the African Fund for Endangered Wildlife. And they are using it as uh, the location where they are breeding and reintroducing the giraffes into the wild. And it's a really successful, it's a hotel as well. The, the, the giraffes literally live there. That's where everything happens. They are breeding, they are feeding, you know, they're they just roaming the grounds of the manor. And they interact with the guests, as you can see here. So it's a really... Um, this is one of the most sea places, you know, that I would say they, they, they really allow the giraffes run of the place. They You can find them in the, your bedroom, in the dining area, being fed by the guests, eating sometimes out of the guests' plates. So this is a really unique way of um, monitoring the, you know, the development and the, the progress that they're making with conservation. It's called the Giraffe Manor and it's in Kenya. Remember Kenya is Eastern part of Africa. And so we come to the most visit destinations. Now across Africa, there are a total of 147 UNESCO heritage sites. And I think there's still some more that are being, um, that are being looked at, you know, to be included on the list. And this includes the savannas, the pyramids, you know, and so, and then the eight, like really ancient sites, you know, and much more. One of the places is Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. This is, this is just awesome. Uh, Victoria Falls is also somewhere that I think I would love to visit. Just the sheer drop of the waterfalls and then the volume of water just the sheer volume of water and the way it sprays into the air and even from a distance. And so everywhere around that waterfall is just verdant because the water drops and then it lifts so high, 
you know, and it sprays all over and there's like a permanent mist in that whole area and around those villages. So this is Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. And they are supposed to be fault lines, a separation of the land across fault lines. And then it created that huge drop. Um, and so you can see the mist I'm talking about. The Victoria Fall actually has, I think, a larger volume of water and a, a higher drop. And you can also see these are the pyramids of yes. Giza. I think in the past few years, because of some unrest in the region, it has stopped being as popular. Uh, a popular destination as it used to be, but it's still a sight to see, just to see the sheer size, the volume of it, you know, see the people looking like dots and then the, the, the structure looking so huge. And then you're wondering how did they even do this? You know, um, one of the unexplained wonders of the world is also um, a UNESCO heritage site and definitely worth a visit. I believe things have calmed down. I know one or two people that have been to Egypt to view the pyramids in recent times, um, but it's worth checking out. And then you have Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest peak in Africa. And it um, in one of the few, very few places you find snow at the top, um, there have been a lot of expeditions. So many people have documented their journeys of traveling and then climbing the peak, you know, and coming out. I think it's really well organized. I was also saying that the, the indigenous act as guides, you know, to... The interesting thing about most mountains in Africa is they're believed to be places where the gods are. They are places where the gods are. So... Sometimes indigents may have to carry out some rites and sacrifices and petition the gods, you know, before people are allowed to come in. There's a peak we have in my village as well is the same thing. No one is allowed to go except designated priests, you know, and all of that um, priests of the gods that are represented there. So that's just for your information. All right. So this brings us to the end of it. Um, like I said, I'm really curious to know who who has been there, you know, and who um, your experience of it, you know, were you able to take the full tour? Were you able to see all the animals? You know, so I had the opportunity of going to, of going to Kruger Park in South Africa some years ago but honestly i have to be honest that camping outside and tour is not my thing it's not really what i would like to do with my time so i i ended up not going i was in johannesburg and the hotel where i was staying were organizing these uh tour tour that you know the tour to kruger park but i didn't go because it's not it's typically not what i would do like I say, because here we're so close to the animals, you know, you don't have to go too far before you see the animals, even though they are like depleting, they are, uh, you, 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 I never could walk and see a lion, but it's just seems so close to me. And I'm not sure I am so fascinated by seeing a lion anyway, <clears throat> because, you know, growing up in that area where there would be lions, you are taught to be careful and so that desire to be out in the wild, to see wild animals has never been, you, rather you're warned away from it, rather than being told is something fascinating to go and see. So I just don't have that mindset of going off into the wild, in the bush with the sand and grass and trees and bugs to go and look at animals. You know, so I totally declined. And I think I missed that opportunity. I'm not sure I would go ever. But um, that would have been something. So we'd love to hear your opinion and the the sense of maybe awe or, you know, whatever your experience was about going. And if in any of the other African sites you've been to, like the pyramids, you've been to the falls, you know, you, um, you've been around Mount Kilimanjaro, um, we'd also love to hear um, about that. 
Okay, so I also want to share what we are doing in the block of the month in 2024. In 2024, we, we decided to focus our blocks on the big five, the African big five, as well as other animals that are most popular in Africa. We've gone on now for three months. We started in January with the lion and then we went on to the giraffe. And this month we're talking about the elephant. And um, it's been amazing. We the structure of the, the Quilt Africa Fabrics block of the month is interesting. It's not a it's not it's not structured in the way that you would imagine. It's flexible and we make it to suit ourselves as much as possible. And so we've worked out a lot of the kinks, you know, um, the methods, you know, and the templates, you know, and stuff like that. And so three months in, we are opening the doors for new members. And so the highlight of this um, visit to Africa, the slides I shared prior to now, is kind of open your world and to help spotlight what we are doing in the block of the month. So I'll quickly go through that. Say that the objective of the block of the month is to help is, is to help you fine tune your quilting skills and also to help you discover how the African fabrics work for you. So in the block of the month, we only use, we mostly use African fabrics, 75%, some solids, and then one or two other fabrics that means something to you as a quilter, you know, you can include that. As part of the block of the month, you receive one, one block at a time, you will receive 12 blocks, one each month of 12 animals. So like I said, so far, the lion, the giraffe and the elephant are already available. And so for April and the rest of the months, it's going to be a different animal per month. All these are housed in a portal where you have access to it, you have access to the videos. For each of the animals, I talk about it much the same way I did with the big five. So you, you have an understanding of them as individual animals, their characteristics, where they are found, and any other unique thing, you know, that um, we can share about the animals. We have tutorials. We have work-alongs that are mostly us working. It's not one person doing the tutorial. It's one person working it out, but it's with input from everyone else. Like I said, the block of the month is unique. It's not like anything you have seen or probably partic most likely participated in. You know, it's unique in its own way. And so you have the monthly live sessions and the video recordings. And then I think the highlight also is the show and tell we have at the end of every month where everyone gets together to show what they've done for the month and also to talk about the challenges, you know, and the most um, amazing aspect of producing that block for them. Um, and so these are some of the, some of the blocks from members. This is from Lorraine Hunter Brooks. She, you can see her lion um, with a background and you can also see the giraffe and the cute huts at the back. Um, the choice of fabric, you know, it's really up to you. There is no right way. There is no wrong way. There is just your way, you know, of recreating. And so she is. Yeah, this is quite good. This is interesting. This is a conversation starter. It's anywhere she takes it, I think. You really get some. I do like her use of fabrics though, for the palms, for the trees, you know, the huts and even the animals. And so this one is by Margot. Um, also fantastic use of fabric. She's kept it simple. She's kept her background simple, but you can see the thoughts that went into the selection of her background fabrics. Um, behind the lion just looks like sky, right? It just looks like blue sky, you know, over the lion and the red earth, which is really reminiscent of Africa. 
And so you have the giraffe as well. Some of these are works in project in, pro, in progress because what we're doing is you have the choice of making small blocks of animals or you have the choice of making one big large piece that you incorporate your animals into. You also have a choice of making each of these blocks like larger wall hanging size. So a lot of it we're putting in the work, but we're, you know, seeing how it comes together and then you're finishing it finishing it up to see how best it works for you. And so now we have this by Carrie. Carrie has just been amazing. This is her second time in the block of the month. And she's been amazing with her blocks each time. And you can also see the background and just the interesting bits of details that she's putting in. I like the proportion with the giraffe, just showing how tall it is with the tree you know and the little shrub it just gives you an idea of the size and scale you know also excellent use of fabric and I think for me this is by Miss Valerie awesome use of fabric the background is just just looks like a jungle lion just prowling about looking for lunch or something you know so for me, the most interesting part, two things is one is the use of fabric, how everyone just fussy cuts where necessary and then interprets the elements of each, what they want to achieve and then finding the right fabric and using. This one is by Lisa. Um, you can just see the landscape behind, it's just amazing. She's used Vazine, she's used the fabrics, you know, and and also the techniques. Now, some people come in already with skill. They know how to, they know what to do. Some others don't have the skill, you know, but just by virtue of being in the group and seeing what other people are doing and exploring, um, they're able to come up with some amazing, amazing things. So, like I said, the block of the month is open for you to join. Um, we have available monthly memberships, quarterly memberships, or the annual membership. So I'll be sharing details of it. And if all of this information from the real life African animals to what we're doing with the fabrics in the block of the month appeals to you, then I encourage you to sign up, you know, and see what you can do how you can interpret an African safari with fabrics. All right, so I'm going to stop share now and ask everyone to unmute and share with us their experiences, their African experiences. I really want to hear the countries you've been to, um, how you found the, the parks, you know. We do have, we do have like two, we do have two reserves reservations or reserves, animal reserves. So the problem is that typically across the tribes in most of West Africa, we eat all the animals. We eat the elephants and eat the lions and eat the all the everything. So the reserves don't work very well because people just want to eat them. And they're delicacies and they are all bush meat and they are really expensive and they are not come the, you know it's it's like special food it's not food you eat all the time so so it's really sought after and i think that's one of the big big reasons why the reserves have not worked in africa <laughs> i've not worked in western africa you know because it's considered food people are like we want to eat this why are you <laughs> telling us not to eat it you know so I want to hear your experience about it. We have a small one in Bauchi State. That's where I schooled. I've been there like severally. You know, lots of um, the elephants are there. Some of the other animals, you know, the monkeys, the baboons, which are peculiar to um, us here in Western Africa. And some of the other animals are there. You know, So that's my little experience of, and the, the, near, the, the miss with the Kruger Park in South Africa. So uh, um, who would like to go first? I will. Um, I like to share my experience, Miriam. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I had the opportunity in 2019 to go to the Masamari um, National Reserve in Kenya. 
and more of the big five um, animals were there. It was really a wonderful experience. Um, and then the first time I've ever done a safari, it was a bus safari in South Africa. And that was in Plainsburg. And that was really nice too. So those are my two experiences. But mm -hmm. I just so amazed at the size of the giraffes. That was just amazing. Um, and I love elephants, but I really enjoyed this. So I took a lot of pictures and um, have a lot of those pictures so that I'm I'm thinking about the block of the month. So, <laughs> so I think that would be good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I know Dale travels to Africa often, like so often, maybe like every, at least once a quarter, you know, she has some charity, she supports, she does some work in, in Western Africa, in Eastern Africa as well. Um, so she's well-traveled and definitely has the experience. She's had a health scare, but I'm so grateful to God that she's doing well. She's well on the mend now. And she will probably take off to Africa as soon as she can. She gets clearance from her doctor. So thank you so much, yeah. um, Dale, for sharing your experience. Yeah. Thank you, Marion. Oh, yeah. Marion, I've also been to the safaris. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. My daughter went to school in South Africa at Rhodes University back in, I think it was 2005. And we took a week and we went over to, I think it was called Cariega reserve in south africa amazing it was a small mm -hmm. family run but we got to see mm -hmm. all big five got we sat out in the jeeps and waited for the lion to make its kill of course it didn't in front of us but we still got to see the lions we had a buffalo come right up to the side of the car one morning because they were raising buffalo there because they needed them out in the the safari area and stuff but like Dale just said, the size of the giraffes was like amazing that I actually have a picture. We were so close to the giraffe. I have a picture of the giraffe going to the bathroom, <laughs> but it was just a great experience. And then I did one in um, Dakar in Senegal, outside of Dakar, not really a safari. If you put it in my book, we went around in a taxi and stuff, but you know, they, they did have some animals there and stuff, but it wasn't like what you see in South Africa and other places. Thank you so much. So I, I would say the one in Dakar, Dakar being in West <laughs> Africa, I would say it's about the same as what we have here. They've eaten all the animals. And so we just know, I'm going to have to ask her because I'm going over in a few weeks and I'll have to okay. ask her what she hears of people eating it. But I mean, this one that we went to, they called it the safari and her friends that had never been to a safari thought this was wonderful. But being we had been to the one in South Africa, yes. Yes. This one was more yeah. of like the old fashioned zoo because like the hyena was behind a fenced railing and stuff. It was kind of, it wasn't, they weren't roaming free like mm -hmm. they do in the really big parks. Okay. The one in Nigeria is actually free. The one in Bauchi, they roam free um, over a large area, but it's just that the volume of the animals isn't so much, but you typically would see the elephants and their babies Um you might be lucky to see the lion because there are not so many. So they don't really come out the way they would if they were really in the wild. Um, and then you'd see the leopard. We have lots of hyenas, leopards, you know, um, and the gorillas and the baboons are really. So if you think of the, the giraffe manor in Kenya, imagine that, but for baboons and the monkeys in Nigeria. So they are in the the residential not i mean not well they could get into your room if you left left it open but yes, they, are, they are told the us they not did. to eat yes. outside yes. because the monkeys mm -hmm. would come but i remember when i landed and i had to fly them from johannesburg down to port elizabeth and the driver was taking mm -hmm. me to um roads and i saw all these little monkeys all over out in the, on the side of the road and stuff and i'm like oh my god there's monkeys yes. but it's kind of like if you were to come here we have all these squirrels all over the place monkeys all over the place and giraffes in the <laughs> yes. distance it was just absolutely gorgeous yes. yeah it's beautiful it's yeah. really beautiful we have baboons and the gorillas and then the monkeys there's a cold and warm pool there's a warm pool natural pool there so they hang out there 
And so if you're eating your snack and you leave it, they just swoop down so low and grab it yep. and they're off. You know, yeah. so that's um that's really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. But honestly, in Western Africa, we do not have much of reserves. That's just the no. truth. Um, no, there's it's not. my personal opinion. I just think you know the animals. <laughs> but I don't know tortoise, if that's back to my side. farm or something. I remember her going and seeing some yeah. big something hundred year old tortoise there. I haven't seen that. Yes, I might go this 200, time. Two hundred, We do have that. Yeah. Well, yes. But the yeah. big five, you have to be outside mm -hmm. of West we Africa. You have the You're church. Not see it there. Yes, I think typically so as well. Even the hyenas now are caged in yes. Western Africa. Yes, they it's, were caged. It's not. It's just not a big deal to be. Thank you so much for sharing, Linda. You're any welcome. other experiences or anyone with plans? Anyone planning on a safari or an African visit? I heard while I was in the background um, about some African tours. Um, I think it's really a fantastic, uh, so I've been to about a few African countries and I did think I would enjoy them, but then I find it's so, I mean, even as an African, just going to the next African country has just been so amazing because, so I used to think, oh, we're so similar, you know, but, but no, there's so much to see, you know, been to Togo, Benin, Ghana, um, South Africa, and I'm and Gambia. I missed my chance to go into Lesotho. But it's just each country is amazing. Um, it may not be on the map, it may not be on the UNESCO list, but there's so much to see. From the seaside, if you are ever at the you know, you go to the coast to the villages, but just being able to, to be in that area you know, to see what it was like, the ferry ride and all of that. Same thing in, in, in Ghana. In Ghana, there's so much to see. Um, so I, I'm trying to say, you don't have to say, oh, it has to be the UNESCO list. It has to be the heritage sites. Any country you go, there are things, so much to see. The, the architecture is one. The architecture from one place to the other is so different. Even the wall art that you'd say, oh, we have wall art in my country. If you go to the next country, the way they approach their patterns and the wall art is also so different, you know? So I encourage you, of course, if it's possible, if it fits within your schedule, coming to Africa is fantastic. So I did mention that we, we would be, well, I'm playing with the idea of having people over. In, so... I'm a little bit squeamish about Nigeria because you have this on and off uh, things going on, you know? So I want to be sure that everybody is okay. We're still a little bit unsettled from our last elections. So <laughs> I don't know. So <clears throat> if we do come, because I, I have experience with visiting other African countries, and it will be a shame if you come to Africa and you don't come to Nigeria. So I'm torn between wanting to give everyone an African experience and then wanting everybody to be safe and all right. But when I say safe, it's really not that it's not safe. We have people coming in every day, but you just, I just have this wild thought. What if, you know? Um, so I'm still torn about it, but it's something that I have totally planned, looked up with... Um, tour guides, you know, that would take you to the really interesting places. And please don't get me wrong, Nigeria is not unsafe. It's generally not unsafe. You know, it's just that we are going through a phase, you know, that I want to be sure that once anyone comes, it is absolutely, um, our tourism has actually risen in the past like couple of years. People are coming in to see our traditional buildings. They're coming in to see the traditional rulers, the individual, you know, so much to see. There's just really so much to see. So we'll see. Um, yeah, you have the so, unrest right they're having in Senegal now because of the political stuff. Yes, <laughs> it's the political stuff, actually. Yeah. Um, so Kelly says she'll be going to Kenya on a textile tour with safaris in the area. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that Kenya has much textile. Um, but definitely the safaris, yes. Definitely the safaris. Kenya has one of the most amazing 
um, it has a more developed tourist thing <laughs> than other African countries. So if you're thinking tourists, you're thinking Egypt, you're thinking Kenya, you're thinking South Africa. But that is not to say that they have the most things to see. I'd rather say they just have more, it's more structured. It's more structured and it's more, it's more popular because they've been at it for so long. So automatically it's Kenya, automatically it's South Africa, you know, but that, that is not to say the other countries don't have, they, they have just structured theirs <laughs> in a more fluid way than the other countries. So anyone else going? Um, Oh, I'm unmuted. I was I was withholding because I'm saying I have never been on a um, actual safari and have not had the opportunity to visit the um, the African um, continent yet. But that being said, I have been on safari on a quilt on a um, virtual quilt retreat because um, yes. Lakeside. One of our members, her daughter and a friend went to Africa <clears throat> and went on a safari and took all kinds of pictures. So they created a safari experience. That's oh, when I learned yeah. about the big five. Um, yes. So I had that. Thank I have you. several friends, uh, golf friends who do a lot of international travel. And so I live oh. vicariously from their postings. And so I've yeah. seen things and it's just like, I got to decide what I want to do. And then my first cousin, my mother's, um, my uncle's um, daughter, she and her daughter went to Ghana. Um, I'm trying to think if it was earlier this year or the end of last year. And they were there for like five or six weeks, just hanging out going all you know hanging out at the beach hanging this was her way to decompress from her father passing so she went and spent like five weeks in Ghana and was yeah. posting stuff so I've done some virtual stuff but I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to put together a plan so if you did something anything that would say okay now it's time to hop on a plane and go and go to yes. um Africa, I'd, 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 I'd be, I'm, <clears throat> I guess my problem is, is that there've been, there are opportunities like so creative and so on and so forth, but I'm always more concerned about not the where, but the who, the people that I'm traveling with, yes. not yeah. just going, you know, going and some people just, you know, they're like, they're on the tour, they're hanging out, they're having, so, so having something that has a known quantity is more appealing yes. to me personally. Yeah. Yeah. So I so agree with you. The travel is as much important as the experience. Yes. yes <laughs> I yeah. absolutely agree with you. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, th I think it's something that we are totally ripe for. Um, and I will not, I will, I won't allow my, my desire for you to be in my homeland to stop me from planning something, you know? So if I feel in 2025, um, excluding Nigeria is the best thing for everyone, then so mm -hmm. be it, you know? But I do believe that there's so much, there is just so much to enjoy, both from, mm -hmm. uh, from the offerings that will interest you as a quilter and just also the, just the general knowledge, the particular traditional, you know, things that you'll get mm -hmm. to experience. And then just the joy of being in a new place, seeing mm -hmm. new things, experiencing. I mean, travel, I haven't traveled now for maybe going on 10 years. And I think mm -hmm. it's one of the things I miss most, just taking that jump and then finding yourself somewhere and seeing how different it is and then mm -hmm. seeing how the same it is. I think mm -hmm. it's just absolutely good. And I have some fantastic ideas so far on all the people traveling here and there. I haven't heard anyone like mention it, so I'm not going to mention it. Um, I want to reserve that exclusively for us in the yes, tribe. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> when we do plan our trip to come on. So um, I'll really push for it, you know, 
2025 is a good time. Um, it's a good time. I don't know how you feel about spending Christmas away from home, but Christmas time is usually a very good time for travel as well. You have all the festivals, you have the carnivals, you have so many things going on, you know, that you could be a part of. And there's just a general buzz. Mm -hmm. It's the end of the year, you know, people are relaxed, but uh, well, for us, it will be we're coming home, but for you, it will be away from home around Christmas. So I don't know how that would sit well, but that is not to say that other times wouldn't be good as well. So I'm definitely going to put my attention into coming up with a, with a plan you know, and then we'll see how how that will go. I think it's really fantastic. It's just amazing to just take that trip. You know, Absolutely. just take that trip. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um. So any any more comments, any questions, anything you would like to find out? Because I, I always try to give you mm -hmm. reference for locations to let you know that north and south and east and west are kind of distinctively different. And what you will find in one region, you may not really find in another region. And just to give you a sense of, um, just reference, just a sense of knowledge so that you know, um, no one just says Africa and you just assume it's the whole continent. So if you have any questions about anything, I'll be happy to answer. no questions okay um but i would still insist that the what when it comes to safari your best bet is the east and the south mm -hmm. if it comes to far <laughs> your best bet is west uh -huh. um if, if if you're thinking about um you're of african ancestry you're thinking of tracing your roots having a feel for what your people were like definitely In west west Africa. West Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 99.9% .9 of everybody's DNA is West Africa, you know. Um, so um, that would, and then if you look at the makeup, you're also seeing that the actual Negroids are in Western Africa. Mm -hmm. um, the There's a name for it, I've forgotten, but, but just historically, the ships went out of Africa. Yeah. And of course, at that time, there wasn't that transcontinental exchange, so much of it. You find the odd person. Oh, this person has South African DNA. How come? You know, everyone is shocked. It's not the norm. So you find mm -hmm. that 97% is in West Africa. So if mm -hmm. you do want to travel, you're, you're of African um, descent. I'll encourage you to come to West Africa and feel the vibe and the rhythm of the blood that actually flows in you. You will find mm -hmm. that in West Africa, mm -hmm. you know, and then mm -hmm. there are particular countries that would really resonate with you from, uh, you know, from, uh, what do you call it, from an identity um, perspective. So that's um, that's just that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the just the information and the just exposure. I think most most of what we usually learn about the animals is from National Geographic movies and cartoons. <laughs> so I try to just get as real as possible to what the animals are like. You know, there's so much information about their habits, you know, and maybe, you know, more particular information that we can't really get into. But this is just an overview. So thank you so much for coming in the absence of any questions. I apologize once again for the delay um, earlier, and I appreciate your staying with me. So thank you so much. Um, details will probably be having, because of this glitch, people who signed up to watch on YouTube. So I'll probably be repeating it. But that's not for you, most likely. You stay through. I will send that out. So thank you so much for coming, Dale. It's so amazing to see you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eileen um, and Gwen and Dee, Ernestine. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Pat. And Cassandra, so happy to see you. Thank <laughs> you so much.
Thank you. I will you. see you soon. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. 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 All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. 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 Bye.